Part 5. Mises in Geneva. Chapter 16. The Geneva Years. The economic crisis heightened political antagonisms throughout Europe. Fewer and fewer citizens believed democracy could meet the current challenges. Only two alternatives seemed available, both based on violence. Either the dictatorship of the proletariat, or more precisely, the dictatorship of labor union bosses and socialist party leaders, or an authoritarian dictatorship bent on restoring the old order. In the wake of a financial scandal on February 6, 1934, two right-wing mass organizations demonstrated in the streets of Paris. The angry mobs tried to storm the Palais Bourbon, whereupon the police opened fire, killing fifteen and wounding many hundreds. The French government, under Daladier, stepped down, and the violence spread to other countries, including Austria. Mises later said that it was the growing power of the Nazi party in Austria that prompted him to leave the country. With this remark, he did not refer to the government of Engelbert Dollfuss, which had reintroduced authoritarian corporatism into Austrian politics to resist the socialism of both the Marxist and the Nazi variety. Mises meant the Austrian branch of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which enjoyed strong backing from Berlin and fought a daily battle to conquer the streets of Vienna. Dollfuss's authoritarian policies were, in his view, only a quick fix to safeguard Austria's independence. Unsuitable in the long run, especially if the general political mentality did not change. In March 1934, Mises was delighted to receive an offer from the Geneva-based Graduate Institute of International Studies to become a visiting professor of international economic relations. He accepted immediately. However, he did not flee Austria as he would when the Nazis seized control of the country four years later. He moved to Geneva in disgust, but he considered the move temporary. Mises had been an employee of the Kammer long enough to qualify for early retirement, but he did not wish to burn his bridges, and eventually arrived at an agreement according to which he would do some work for it during his school vacations and be paid half his former salary. As we learn from a letter dated October 31, 1934, from the Kammer to Mises. The file also concerns salary statements for the years 1936 and 1937. In both years, Mises had a gross annual income of 14,620 shillings. In early December 1934, he returned to Vienna for the first time and worked some weeks in his old position. Thereafter, he continued to work as a consultant and liaison officer for the Vienna Kammer. He often came to the Austrian capital in the middle of the week for one or two days. Whenever he was in Vienna, he visited with Margit. She was still waiting for him. He could not make his mind up about proposing. For another three years their love could not get out from under the shadow of his mother. Institut des Autitudes Internationales Geneva had been a quiet town before the First World War, even though it already hosted the International Red Cross Committee. After the war, it became the home of the International Labour Office, 1919, and of the League of Nations, 1920. The latter was the result of an initiative of U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. The idea was to create an international political organization that would resolve conflicts between nation-states without resorting to war. Ironically, Wilson did not receive the necessary ratification from the U.S. Senate for the United States to join the new organization. The League began its operations in 1921 without the participation of the man who had created it. Geneva was chosen for its location because of the long-standing neutral status of Switzerland, a status that in those days had more than mere nominal significance, and because Geneva was culturally a French city. One of the most pressing problems for the new international bureaucracies was the lack of qualified employees. To cope with this problem, a Swiss director of the League named William E. Rappard, 1883-1958, proposed the creation of a special bilingual school for the advanced scientific study of problems of international politics and administration. The school was to offer courses in French and English and make full use of the resources of the League and the ILO 
in the form of specialized knowledge, documents, and direct observation of how international affairs were conducted in the new context of multilateralism. Rapar was a diplomat and constitutional historian who combined in himself all the qualifications necessary to breathe life into this project. His mother was a scion of the Hoffman La Roche family from Basel. In July 1919, William Emmanuel Rapar became Secretary General of the New League of Red Cross Societies, a position he quit in 1921. Before 1919, he was already a member of the International Committee of the Red Cross. His magnum opus was the Bundesverfassung der Schweizer Eidgenossenschaft, 1848-1948, Vorgeschichte, Ausarbeitung, Weiterentwicklung. He was not only a brilliant diplomat, with connections to politicians, scholars and statesmen, private firms and foundations, as well as government institutions in France, Britain, Switzerland and the United States, but was also a highly respected scholar with appointments at Harvard University and the University of Geneva, where he served as an influential member of the Academic Senate and even briefly headed the university itself. Last but not least, he had the good fortune to enjoy the personal friendship of Woodrow Wilson, his colleague at Harvard from 1911 to 1913. This certainly proved to be helpful in more than one respect. Elected as rector in 1926, Rapar launched the new School of International Political Relations as a joint venture of the University of Geneva, which provided academic affiliation and oversight, and the Rockefeller Foundation in New York, which pledged to finance the school in cooperation with the city of Geneva and the Swiss federal government. Rapar had been in touch with the Rockefeller Foundation since 1924, or more precisely, with the Loris Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund. In 1926, Rockefeller representative Dr. Abraham Flexner pledged five annual payments of 20,000 US dollars to the Geneva Department of Education, giving the green light to the creation of the school. This was the same Flexner who had written the famous Flexner Report, Medical Education in the United States and Canada a report to the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, 1910, which led to the closure of four out of six medical schools in the United States. Rapin hired the Frenchman Paul Montoul as its first director. The school opened its gates in September 1927 under the name Institut des Hautes Etudes Internationales, Graduate Institute of International Studies. The Rockefeller Foundation's pledge of financial support was extended and increased in subsequent years, and the Foundation would continue to be the main financial sponsor for nearly 20 years. By 1938, the school was receiving annual payments of 80,000 US dollars, and by March 1948, it had received a total of 1.4 million. Rapin and Montou had first met at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. Rapar had been granted special diplomatic observer status due to his personal acquaintance with Woodrow Wilson, and Montou was the principal interpreter in the Allied camp and wrote the official records of the Council of Four. During the war he had served as a personal interpreter between his college friend Albert Thomas and Lloyd George, both of whom were commissioned to coordinate the reorganization of the British and French munitions industry. At the end of the war, George was Prime Minister, and Thomas could soon become the first president of the International Labour Organization in Geneva. The die was cast, Montou's new career was made. Rapin had known Montou already through his writings on economic history, which had won Montou an excellent international reputation. As a young man, he had published a monograph on the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, which brought him quick fame and catapulted him into the higher strata of French academics and politics. A few months after the Versailles Conference, he became Rapin's colleague in the Directorate of the League of Nations. Giving his academic and political background, he was an obvious and excellent choice for the new school. Rapin later joined Montou in the management of the Institute, and together they led it for about 20 years. The harmonious cooperation between the two men proved to be the foundation of the Institute's success and its cordial atmosphere, which made it attractive as a destination for scholars from around the world. The position at Mises would hold for six years was a one-year renewed visiting position for economists of international reputation. In 
His predecessors had been Samuel Patterson, Philadelphia, Frank Graham, Princeton, and Jacob Viner, Chicago. Other recent visiting economists of international pedigree were Gustav Kassel, Stockholm, and Theodore Gregory, London. It might well have been Gregory who brought Mises to Geneva. They had known each other for many years, and in 1933-1934 cooperated closely in the International Chamber of Commerce. Michel Halperin later stated that Ropin and the economists had particular affinities with Charles Rist, Jacques Ruff, Jacob Weiner, and Lionel Robbins. All the initiative could have come from someone else, Professor Alfred Zimmern, for example, who ran the Geneva School of International Studies and had asked Mises in December 1929 to recommend suitable students for scholarships. Zimmern was a professor at the University of Geneva and head of international affairs at the Institute for Intellectual Cooperation. Before the establishment of the Institut, he had run summer vacation schools on international affairs, the Zimmern School, for some years. He then moved to Oxford University. In any case, it's fairly certain that Mises's long-standing and close association with the Rockefeller Foundation proved to be beneficial once again. He himself had been very active in helping colleagues from Germany find new jobs abroad after Hitler rose to power in January 1933, and at least some of these new positions were likely financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was natural, therefore, that he himself receive support once the political situation in Austria became untenable for him. This was certainly the case after the violence of February 1934 and its aftermath. While it would be an exaggeration to say that Mises was on the payroll of the Rockefeller Foundation, this was effectively precluded both by Rapa's insistence that funds be received with no strings attached and by the co-financing of the Institute from Swiss sources. The fact remains that during the Geneva years Mises' salary was paid to a large extent out of Rockefeller money, and so things would remain for the next decade. This strong financial connection, dependence, was downplayed by all sides. In 1942, Tracy Kittredge wrote in a letter to the U.S. State Department that the Foundation has been familiar with the work of Professor von Mises for more than ten years and has contributed to it research projects under his direction in Vienna and in Geneva and to his present stipend at the National Bureau of Economic Research. In fact, the Rockefeller Foundation paid the NBER stipend in full. Academic Life Rapport quipped that the Institute owed the excellence of its teaching staff to Hitler and Mussolini. A case in point was Guillermo Ferrero, who had been under house arrest in Italy before coming to Geneva as a professor of history, and it was also true for men like Mises, Kelsen and Röpke, who found in the Institute a political safe haven. In Kelsen's case, language also played a role to the extent that he was fluent in French, but had difficulties with the English language. When Kelsen was ousted from his chair at the University of Cologne in 1933, he received offers from the Institute, from LSE, and from the New School for Social Research. The language issue prompted him to opt for Geneva, where professors could teach in French. Mises' command of English was also much weaker than his French. Once they located on the shores of Lake Geneva, these refugee scholars discovered that their new school also offered a congenial social and intellectual atmosphere. Mises arrived in the fall of 1934 and took an apartment on 16 Chemin Grieg, literally the war path. But after the first extension of his visit, he moved to nicer accommodations on Trois Chemins du Mât. At that point, the permanent faculty featured, in addition to Rapin and Mantou, Eugène Borel, Mac Eastman, Economics, Hans Weberg, International Law, Maurice Bourcoin, Diplomatic History, Bittman Potter, Political Science, Paul Guggenheim, International Public Law, Guillermo Ferrero, Modern History, Karl Burkhardt, Modern History, and Hans Kelsen, Law. The personal relationships among these men appear to have been extraordinarily cordial, by the standards of academic life at any rate. What is amazing is that there was something like a social life there at all. These famous scholars did what other professional groups did as well, exchange visits, entertain one another at home, and become acquainted with the family members of their colleagues. And they liked it. Mises was apparently most at ease with Rapin, Montou, Bourcoin, and Ferrero. <laughs>
He also associated with scholars from the League of Nations Economic Intelligence Unit, Loveday, Habler, Tinbergen, Mead, Koopmans, Pollock, Fleming, Nurkse, Kontliff, and Hilgert, the International Labour Office, Karl Primrum, and the Geneva Research Centre, John B. Witten. The most immediate common bond among these groups was that they all depended on funding from the Rockefeller Foundation, which in those very years launched a massive international program of business cycle research, with a special focus on economic stabilization. The Foundation not only funded the economists working at the League of Nations and at Rapa's Graduate School, but also business cycle institutes in Louvain, New York, Paris, Sofia, Vienna and Warsaw. Its offices were careful not to impose any research agenda, but their wishes could not be ignored. Thus, a group of financially endowed laymen had a decisive impact on the path that business cycle research would follow over the course of the coming decades. The League's authority and Rockefeller's money gave leadership to people such as Alexander Loveday and Alvin Hansen. Business cycle research would henceforth be conducted with an increasingly quantitative orientation. By the time Mises moved to Geneva, he was already an anachronism, a vestige of the early Rockefeller involvement in the social sciences. These developments were noticeable but not yet dominant in 1934. Mises and others could conduct their research as they saw fit, and in Geneva they could do it under the most pleasant circumstances. Much of the Institute's conviviality was related to size. Throughout the 1930s, the school remained small and virtually free from the plague of bureaucracy. Its administration counted a mere six heads and one part-time accountant. Student numbers almost never exceeded 100, and just under half of them were enrolled in a doctoral program. The permanent faculty had 12 members at its peak in 1938, including Rapin and Montou. Montou was not present all the time. Already in 1928, he had moved his home to Paris because the city on the Seine offered better educational possibilities for his children and also because he continued to work on the official records of the Versailles Conference. This had prompted Rapin to join him as a co-director of the Institute in the same year. These residential scholars were complemented by one or two visiting professors who stayed for a semester or a year, and there were also guest lecturers who gave high-profile short courses, which typically ran for a week. The combination of these circumstances made for something approaching academic paradise. Rapin explained the recipe. I know of no better means of being useful to advanced students than placing at their disposal as completely and as informally as possible the most eminent specialists available, if these specialists are well chosen, not only for their intelligence and erudition, but also for their character, and if they are made to realize that their sole professional duty is to contribute to the progress of science through their own work, and to advise and assist the advanced students, I believe our job is practically done. Each professor was free to choose the subject of his courses and seminars. The only constraint was to give, from time to time, some introductory class for non-specialists. In practice, this meant that Mises, on top of the three hours he was required to teach anyway, occasionally had to give an introductory course on economics for non-economists, which he did in rotation with the other economists. The school occupied the basement and first floor of the splendid Plan d'Amour mansion, located on the border of the old city centre at Cinq Promenade du Pain. Mises started lecturing on October 25th, 1934. He gave a two-hour seminar on international finance and a one-hour course on the international aspects of monetary policy, which he held Thursdays from 5.15 to 6 p.m. In one of the first sessions on November 15th, 1934, he gave his inaugural lecture on the gold standard and the problems of controlled currency. Apart from the three hours of required teaching, Mises was free to pursue his research as he saw fit, and all of this at a very comfortable annual salary of 25,000 Swiss francs, or 233.375 ounces of gold, which corresponded to some 8,177 US dollars in the 1930s, and 15 times as much in our day. For years he had told his students that high salaries, combined with few obligations, were the prime factor for the low productivity of university professors. And a few years after he had gone to Geneva, Hayek told him about a discovery he had just made. 
Adam Smith, too, had held this opinion of the consequences of high salaries for academics. Here's Adam Smith, quoted in Hayek's letter to Mises, dated October 15th, 1937. I have thought a great deal upon this subject, and have inquired very carefully into the constitution and history of several of the principal universities of Europe. I have satisfied myself that the present state of degradation and contempt into which the greater part of these societies had fallen in almost every part of Europe, arises principally, first, from the large salaries which in some universities are given to professors, and which render them altogether independent of their diligence. Now was the opportunity for Mises to prove himself wrong by finally writing his general treatise on economic science, a project he had postponed twenty years earlier in anticipation of the coming war. His appointment and the lectures on money coincided with the publication of the English edition of his monetary treatise. After many years, Batson had finally completed the translation with Robbins's help and published the work under the title The Theory of Money and Credit. It was the first foreign edition of a Mises book, perfect timing to support the new professorship in international economic relations. Mises had pursued a hands-off policy with his translator, a policy he maintained for the rest of his life. But while laissez-faire is an unshakable maxim as far as the limitation of governments is concerned, it does not always apply in private affairs. Many years later, Mises complained in correspondence with a young colleague from Austria that good translators were hard to find. I am outright horrified about the sense-distorting errors that I have found in French and German translations of my English publications, and in English and French translations of my German books. In the present case, for example, the title of the English edition, Theory of Money and Credit, certainly made for a smoother reading than the more literal Theory of Money and Fiduciary Media, but it blunted the title's edge. The point of the original title was precisely to highlight the particular character of fiduciary media, which the book showed distorted the operation of a monetary economy. For future scholarship, Mises had to develop his English. In a letter to Mahlup, he observed that one of the practical consequences of Hitlerism was to reduce the importance of the German language. The future belonged to English, and to practice, Mises decided to give his institute lectures in English instead of French. In light of subsequent events, his decision turned out to be extremely fortunate. It was the general policy of the institute that professors and students were required to understand both French and English, but it was customary to speak the language in which one felt most at ease. It was therefore entirely normal that a question be asked in English and the answer given in French. Similarly, in written examinations, students could use either language, regardless of which language had been used for the question. Even greater liberties existed for written homework and doctoral dissertations, which could also be written in German or Italian. This information is taken from the school's catalogue pertaining to the 1939-1940 academic year. But Mises did not master the English language. Tape recordings made in the late 1950s and early 1960s reveal a very strong accent, even after some 30 years of lecturing in English. One might therefore assume that his early lectures in Geneva were quite a challenge to the patience of his audiences. Mises did his best to compensate for his linguistic deficiencies by writing his lectures out in advance, but his delivery remained poor. He was a solid lecturer, but never a brilliant one, and could not compete in the classroom with charismatic speakers such as Bourquin and Rapin, who impressed and overwhelmed their audience through personality and oratorical skills. Harvard graduate Parker T. Hart, who attended the Institute in 1935 to 1936, wrote a revealing student evaluation. At the end of his first semester, Hart did not even mention Mises, but at the end of the second semester, he praised him in the following words. I have gradually come to the conclusion that Professor Mises ranks as one of the best here, as an analyzer of current economic problems. The title of his course is likely to have little relation to the topics treated, but his lectures are always stimulating and lucid, and as a unique feature, always carefully written out in advance. His English leaves a good bit to be desired, from a grammatical point of view, and a first impression is likely to be unfavorable. However, his vocabulary is rich, and his meaning always clear. In short, he wears well, indeed, and for those interested in the economic riddle left by the breakup of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, 
he has an especially valuable contribution to make. Best of all, he is able to enliven his discussions and lectures by concrete experience and first-hand observations drawn from wide travel and research on the spot. This is from a typewritten copy of an extract of Parker T. Hart's report to the Institute of International Education of New York. Rapar had obtained a copy of the report from the president of the Federal Technical University of Zurich, Mr. Rohn, who organized students' exchanges between the United States and Switzerland. The report suggests one of the reasons why he did not produce any outstanding students during his years in Geneva. An even more important reason was the typical mindset of the students at the Institute who are eager to obtain employment in an international organization that is in a government bureau. It is safe to assume that such students were not especially receptive to Mises' message. His two best-known students from these years became experts in the economics of war, Stefan Pozzoni and Edmund Zilberner. Habler later singled out J. Marcus Fleming and Alexandre Kafka. Still, overall relations between Mises and his students were quite good, reflecting the general atmosphere in the Plantamour mansion. A student who was at the Institute during Mises' first two years later recalled a scene from one of the soirées that brought students and faculty together playing charades. Monsieur Montoux found himself paired with Roland Sharp in the role of the classical lovers Leander and Hero. Sharp, despite his little black moustache, managed to achieve a certain feminine charm by tying a bright red ribbon around his hair, mounted a chair behind a high screen, and held aloft a candle to light the way for Leander. Monsieur Montoux bravely cast aside his coat, crossed the Hellespont with a vigorous swimming motion on the floor, and won both first prize of the evening and an abiding place in our hearts as one who was not only a distinguished scholar but also a very good sport. Mises also had great fun pursuing a new hobby, driving. While in Vienna all of his activities took place within the confines of the city centre, his new life in Geneva required greater mobility. To make excursions into the mountains and into France, he needed an automobile. At some point in 1935 or 1936 he must have started taking lessons. In late 1936 he had obtained his driver's license and a car. During his training... He had become so enthusiastic that he bought his first vehicle, a black eight-cylinder Ford called Grand Tourisme Luxe, some six weeks before he got his license. The price of the car was 5,900 Swiss francs, about a quarter of his annual salary. The initial rides he took only with a chauffeur. Then, step by step, he set out for excursions on his own. His first guest for a day tour was Halperin. And in the spring of 1937 he set out with Margit for a two-week vacation to the Côte d'Azur. He was and would always remain a poor driver, but he greatly enjoyed it nevertheless, and he truly wanted to share his new passion with the woman he loved. He made arrangements for Margit to take driving lessons in Vienna. Together they spent many happy hours on the road. Alienation from Former Associates the 1930s witnessed the first phase in a process that distanced Mises from some of his closest associates. The most dramatic cases were those of Fritz Machlup and Lionel Robbins, both of whom would in the course of the years change their views on a number of important issues, particularly on money and the gold standard. In Machlup's case, Mises eventually broke off all contact for a few years. The issue for him was integrity. It was one thing to disagree on the importance of the gold standard, but he believed Mahloub's change of heart to be unprincipled. At a 1965 conference, Mahloub had attributed the attempt to restore a gold standard to special interest politics. Mises was in the audience and thereafter refused to talk to Mahloub. According to his wife, he said, He was in my seminar in Vienna. He understands everything. He knows more than most of them, and he knows exactly what he is doing. In the 1930s, the seeds of this alienation were newly sown, and only hindsight allows us to see where the process began. In 1934, Mahloub left Vienna for the United States on a Rockefeller stipend. From February to June 1935, he lectured at Harvard, and then moved on to a full professorship at a new Rockefeller creation, the University of Buffalo. Rather than a stalwart of the Austrian school, however, Mahloub became part of the new economics movement. Mises must have sensed the shift in his former student. In January 1936, he appealed to him 
I hope that you will not become American over there, but to the contrary, that you convert the Americans to liberalism and Austrianism. They need it indeed. Seventeen months later, he asked rhetorically what the Austrian economists could learn from the new theory of monopolistic competition. Machlup wrote on Mises' letter, That's not the issue, but if we raised the question anyway, the answer would be quite a lot. The break with Lionel Robbins was less severe. At the end of Mises' first academic year in Geneva, Robbins had come to the Institute to give one of the prestigious week-long short courses that attracted not only the entire faculty of the Institute, but also representatives of the local authorities, the diplomatic missions, and the international organization. Robbins delivered a series of lectures in the summer of 1935 on problems of international economic organization. The product of these lectures was a book with the title International Economic Planning. He had brought his family and took the mountain climbing with Mises, the Robbins children would later recall how, after a day of climbing, Mises had filled their rucksacks with Swiss chocolate. But correspondence between the two men stopped after December 1935 and was resumed, somewhat reluctantly on Robbins' part, only in 1943, when Mises made a last attempt to win Robbins back to the side of liberty. Mises commented on the second edition of Lionel Robbins, The Nature and Significance of Economic Science, in particular on Robbins's use of the word experience, speaking about the significance and role of tautologies. Mises said that he had learned from Myerson. Robbins later distanced himself very clearly from the ideas he had cherished in the early 1930s. He said in his autobiography that he wished he had never written his book The Great Depression, 1934, Economic Planning and International Order, 1937, the book in which he published his Geneva lectures, was to be his last Austrian work. In The Economic Basis of Class Conflict, 1939, Robbins started having second thoughts about idle resources, the presence of which he felt undermined the applicability of the Austrian business cycle theory. From then on, the Austrian influence on Robbins's thought receded more and more into the background. Although he remained on friendly personal terms with Mises, they were no longer intellectual comrades in arms. In contrast to Machlup and Robbins, Mises' friendship with Hayek grew stronger during these years, especially during the war. It was Hayek who managed Mises' bank accounts in London. He paid Mises' a subscription for Economica and the Review of Economic Studies and bought books for him, a sign of the great trust Mises put in his former Vienna associate. Apart from his bankers and Gustav Fischer, a quasi-banker for Mises in the early years of German credit controls, the hyper-cautious Mises never let anybody peek into his financial records. The deposit account would be quite substantial after the publication of Theory of Money and Credit and Socialism. In February 1936, Mises had more than £237 in the account. By May 1939, it was almost £780. The crucial factors in their friendship were Hayek's integrity and appreciation for free market, not any one point-by-point -point correspondence in outlook on politics or economics, although Hayek felt it necessary to assure his former mentor that he need have no fear about my becoming converted to Keynesianism. Their friendship grew despite rather significant disagreements. While they did not affect the personal and professional relationships between the two men, these disagreements would come to play a role in the rebirth of the Austrian school after 1974. What were these disagreements? Wieser's impact on Hayek's economic thought made itself felt in Hayek's theories of monetary equilibrium and of neutral money, both theories that Mises would explicitly reject. Other points of contention appeared when Hayek turned to capital theory. In the spring of 1934, Fritz Machlub queried the inner circle of Austrian economists, Mises, Hayek, Striegel, Habler, Machlub, about capital theory in general and the concept of the period of production in particular. Mises had answered Machlub's five questions in May, stating that three of them seemed to be based on an untenable interpretation of the period of production concept. Machlub replied with some astonishment, I should be very grateful for you to write to me whether you totally maintain your fundamental objections against my and Hayek's conceptions. Hayek's new book on capital would from A to Z be subject to your objections, if 
strictly interpreted. One year later, Oscar Morgenstern demolished the idea that the average period production was an adequate measure of capital intensity. Historian Harald Hagemann suggests that this critique was instrumental for Hayek to abandon the period of production concept in later works. Another difference emerged when Hayek turned his attention to the theory of socialism. In 1935, Hayek edited a volume of essays making the case for the impossibility of socialist economic calculation. The volume contained an introductory essay by Hayek, the two classic pieces by Pearson and Mises, and two concluding essays discussing the current state of the debate in the continental literature, Halm, and in English language publications, Hayek. An appendix of the volume featured Baron's 1908 article arguing that a socialist directorate could use a system of general equilibrium equations as a planning device. In his introduction, Hayek pointed out that Mises had been the first writer to emphasize that the pricing process must cover intermediate products and factors of production, lest economic calculation be impossible. Yet by pricing process, Hayek seemed to mean the mere expression of prices in terms of money. In other words, his argument seems to be based on the Visarian assumption that money prices were just one convenient way of expressing values and performing value calculations. In his discussions of the proposal to use mathematical equation systems as economic planning tools, Hayek then admits that this proposal is not an impossibility in the sense that it is logically contradictory. Rather, the true problem of central planning was, according to Hayek, a result of the type and quantity of information required. This distinctive perspective on the problem of economic calculation under socialism was a consequence of Hayek's acceptance of mathematical general equilibrium analysis as the most advanced expression of modern economic science. This was correctly noticed on all sides. For example, Professors Hayek and Robbins of the London School of Economics, who next to Mises are the leading opponents of socialism among economists, have apparently been influenced by Baron. They have taken up a second line of attack the line that is usually taken after a principle has been admitted. They admit that a rational allocation of resources is theoretically possible in a socialist state, but deny that it can be worked out in practice. Central planners would first need precise information about the location and the physical characteristics of every single economic good. Second, they would need to centralize all available technical knowledge, as well as knowledge about how to gain new technical knowledge, techniques of thought. And third, they would need data relative to importance of the different kinds and quantities of consumers' goods. Given these requirements, socialist economic calculation was clearly impracticable, even though it was not, as Mises had contended, impossible. Hayek emphasized, all the difficulties which have been raised are only due to the imperfections of the human mind. But while this makes it illegitimate to say that these proposals are impossible in any absolute sense, it remains not the less true that these very serious obstacles to the achievement of the desired end exist, and that there seems to be no way in which they can be overcome. Hayek's conclusion was that socialist calculation posed insuperable practical difficulties. For him, the formidable cognitive problem of economic calculation without money prices was the beginning and end of his economic argument against central planning. Mises, too, recognized the existence and importance of knowledge problems. He pointed out these problems in his original 1920 article and throughout his later works. But he had also perceived a deeper problem of an altogether different nature. For Mises, the pricing process was not just the solution to an intellectual puzzle, he did not merely express the knowable reality of value in terms of some other knowable reality of money prices. Rather, the pricing process created a reality that could not possibly be known otherwise. Hayek would contend, following Visa, that if the fundamental knowledge problems could be solved, one could calculate the correct prices for factors of production. Mises denied this as even a theoretical possibility. Socialist calculation was for him a conceptual impossibility. In 1938, Mises published an article on using the equations of mathematical economics as the tools of a socialist planning board. The original version of this article was written in German, but never published. A French translation by Gaston Le Duc appeared in 1938 in Charles Rist's Revue d'économie politique in 1938, 
The quoted English translation by Vera Smith was originally prepared for Economica, but not published there because the editorial board of the journal rejected all submissions that had already appeared elsewhere. Here he argued that Hayek had underrated the significance of the assumption that the Socialist Planning Board knows future consumer preferences. Hayek had pointed out that the quest for such knowledge encounters great practical problems. Mises concurred, but there was also a logical riddle, one that subsists even with foreknowledge of the future. One cannot simply plug such known future consumer preferences into a system of equations and obtain a solution of the resource allocation problem. The equations of Valras, Pareto and Baron merely describe how the economy would look in a state of general equilibrium. They describe an economy in equilibrium, not an economy tending toward equilibrium. The real world economy is always in a state of flux. It is continually in disequilibrium. The fundamental economic problem is to choose the best actions to approach the equilibrium state and to do this in the most efficient way. For a person confronted with real world decisions in the present, whether an entrepreneur or a socialist dictator, it is therefore no help whatsoever to know the hypothetical future consumer preferences according to some theoretical construct. His crucial problem is to decide the next step to get closer to equilibrium. The general equilibrium equations themselves offer no information for solving this problem. Mises argued that the decisive advantage the market economy has over socialism is in the use of present experience. For a socialist dictator, the knowledge of present conditions can be no more than a starting point for speculations about the ultimate equilibrium state of the economy, but these speculations are overthrown every day by unforeseen changes. In contrast, the entrepreneurs of a market economy can apply present-day experiences in present-day decision-making. They can use their knowledge of current conditions, supply-side, and current entrepreneurial opinions about conditions in the future demand side, to bring about piecemeal improvements of the existing structure of the economy. Apparently, Mises had presented several versions of the paper to Hayek without gaining his approval. Even the version that was eventually published in the Revue d'Economie Politique did not convince Hayek. He wrote to Mises in a private correspondence, There would be much to say about the paper, but the problem it raises is so broad that it is very difficult to deal with it adequately in a letter. As I mentioned in Paris, I am not yet entirely satisfied, even with the new version of the last section. Suppose all knowledge of the individual entrepreneurs about the future had come together in the head of the economic dictator, and suppose it were conceivable that he solved the countless equations into which these data were to fit, would then really only one other problem remain? A difference between the position of the entrepreneur and of the dictator? I do not quite see it. At that point, Hayek had already published his now famous paper on economics and knowledge, in which he had argued that general equilibrium economics, a la Valras, Pareto, and Visa, was a system of tautological propositions, a pure logic of choice, as it were, and as such unassailable. It did not give an adequate explanation of how real economies work because it assumed from the outset that a fundamental problem has already been solved, namely the problem of knowledge acquisition. Hayek argued that the market could solve this problem because market prices act as a mechanism of communication and that the great deficiency of socialism was precisely that it lacked such a mechanism. Thus Hayek had found his way out of the general equilibrium box. The views he adopted on the theoretical and practical importance of information and the acquisition of knowledge were part and parcel of his attempt to reconcile his Varassian outlook with the facts of life. The problem was, however, that he projected these problems onto all other theorists, and in particular onto Mises. His 1937 essay on economics and knowledge was directed against what he believed to be the a priorism of Mises. The author quotes from a 1981 letter that Hayek wrote to Terence Hutchinson, But the main intention of my 1936 lecture was to explain gently to Mises why I could not accept his a priorism. Curiously enough, Mises, who did not readily accept criticism from his juniors, accepted my argument, but insisted that it was not incompatible with his view. In fact, it was at best a criticism of the unwarranted a priori suppositions of Algassian general equilibrium theory, which Hayek himself was instrumental in spreading. 
Hayek's speculations about the importance of knowledge and information did not change Mises' views about the a priori nature of economic science. Hayek attributed this fact to the intellectual inflexibility of his 66-year-old mentor. Yet it was the young Hayek who lacked openness to new ideas. When Mises published his first pioneering essays on the nature of value and the relationship between economic theory and the real world, Hayek and his fellow students had already made up their minds on these questions. Despite all this, Hayek did continue to be Mises' favorite student and closest ally. He visited Geneva in the spring of 1937 to conduct a brilliant and successful cours temporaire. The lectures were published a year later in one of his best books ever, Monetary Nationalism and International Stability. Unfortunately, Mises could not attend the entire course. Soon after Hayek's arrival, he received terribly bad news about his mother and immediately left for Vienna. Adele von Mises suffered only for a few days. She died on April 18, 1937, and was buried four days later in the presence of her sons. Ludwig had been very close to her, so close that she was an obstacle to marriage with Margit. Now the gates were open for this union. Mises and the Neoliberals The disagreement on the question of socialist calculation was but a symptom of a larger dissent between Mises and his erstwhile comrades in arms. Not only did Mises unabashedly defend the central tenets of the Manchester School, which had by then fallen into general disrepute, he went beyond them. He showed that any third-way system was inherently unstable because it could not solve the problems it purported to solve and thus motivated ever more government intervention until the interventionist system had been transformed into outright socialism. But socialism was not viable. There remained only one meaningful option, 100% capitalism. Again and again Mises insisted that there was no choice in this matter. It was ludicrous to speculate about some particular third-way policy that would fit the sensibilities of a given group. Society was viable only to the extent that private property rights were respected, and that was that. This message resonated well with the old liberals, who marveled at such splendid restatement of the ideals of their youth. But Mises' views were received less wholeheartedly by the rising generation, which had been raised in an intellectual environment soaked in statism. Their school teachers and university professors had come to endorse all the main ideas behind the case for socialism, the doctrine of class conflict and class struggle, the notion of the immiseration of the working classes under capitalism, and the belief that an unfettered capitalist system tended toward monopoly. On the positive side, Mises had definitely dethroned full-blown socialism as a policy ideal. The energies of Hayek, Mahloup, Habler, Robbins, Peru, and Röpke, men who would play a significant role in shaping post-Second World War policies in the Western world, no longer served the idol of omnipotent government. This proved to be of decisive importance for the course of history. But Mises' influence proved too weak to inspire in them the courage necessary for a wholehearted return to the kind of vibrant liberalism that had characterized the Manchester School and the worldwide laissez-faire movement of the 19th century. Mises had not yet published the systematic treatise on economic science that would have clarified the scientific case for unfettered capitalism. He had presented some important elements of his general economic theory of social systems, but before 1940 it was not yet clear how these elements interrelated and on which general analytical framework they relied. In 1940, Mises finally published such a general treatise under the title Nationalökonomie, Theorie des Handelns und Wirtschaftens. But by 1940, Hayek was 51 years old and an established scholar. The book came too late for him, and it also came too late for the rest of his generation, for the Röpkes and Machlups and Robbinses and all the others Mises had steered away from socialism in the 1920s. In the minds of these men, Mises' early work on the impossibility of socialism and the ineffectiveness of interventionism had created a paradox. Mises had convinced them that full-blown socialism was neither feasible nor desirable. They were also persuaded that third-way systems were overrated, but many of them did not yet question the claim that 19th-century liberalism had failed because its economic program, laissez-faire capitalism, had not delivered the goods – 
they believed it to be a simple matter of fact that the unfettered free market tends to a monopoly, and that the 19th century working classes had lived in misery because of laissez-faire capitalism. A revision of the historical performance of 19th century capitalism set things straight after the Second World War. The feeble beginnings are in Eva Hayek, capitalism, and the historians. For these men, theory had disproved the viability of socialism, and history had proven the defects of capitalism. What was needed was a third way, a third way that could somehow get around Mises's demonstration that interventionism was necessarily counterproductive. The solution that emerged in the 1930s was based on an intellectual construct that split the social economy into two elements: one, an institutional framework, and two. The processes that played themselves out within that framework, most notably the pricing process. According to this new creed, government should not meddle with the processes, but it did have to establish and maintain the institutional framework. This set of assumptions is characteristic of what has come to be called neoliberalism. We find a clear expression of the neoliberal worldview in a paper Hayek wrote in 1935. Commenting on Mises's theory of interventionism, Hayek observes that it did not follow from Mises's argument that the only form of capitalism which can be rationally advocated is that of complete laissez-faire in the old sense. He continued, "The recognition of the principle of private property does not, by any means, necessarily imply that the particular delimitation of the contents of this right, as determined by the existing laws, are the most appropriate." The question as to which is the most appropriate permanent framework which will secure the smoothest and most efficient working of competition is of the greatest importance, and one which must be admitted has been sadly neglected by economists. The roots of the neoliberal ideology went back at least to the 1880s and 1890s, when German economists of the historical school and their American disciples became convinced. That industrial concentration has harmful effects and required moderation through government intervention. One of the visible consequences of this mindset was the Sherman Act, which to the present day has replaced the power of consumers with that of bureaucrats. In Germany, the philosophy of the third way became pervasive in the social politique instigated under Kaiser Wilhelm. France followed, invoking the necessity of a tiers solution, as did the United States under the New Deal. Still, the first programmatic statements of neoliberalism were published only in the 1930s. Again, unsurprisingly, in Germany and the United States, the most influential statement came from Chicago economist Henry Simons, who in 1934 circulated a working paper with the title "A Positive Program for Laissez-Faire," in which the word "positive" indicated that this program justified ample government intervention. Whereas classical laissez-faire was a negative program in that it did not provide such a justification, Simons called on government to regulate money and banking, prevent the formation of monopolies, and provide minimum income for the destitute—a departure indeed from laissez-faire liberalism. These ideas perfectly expressed the feelings of a generation of economists who had been raised in a thoroughly statist intellectual environment, but who still knew the teachings of the classical liberals. F. R. Hayek, Wilhelm Röpke, Fritz Machlup, Milton Friedman, Michael Polanyi, Walter Eucken, and many others received their university training and their decisive intellectual impulses during the 1920s and early 1930s. During the later 1930s, they began to acquire more senior positions and would, after the Second World War, assume intellectual leadership on the right. Some of them, most notably Hayek, later turned toward a more laissez-faire stance. But this turn came at a time when the neoliberal steamroller was already well under way. Their neoliberalism animated the work of the post-war institutions that would stem the tide of growing statism, in particular the Mont Pelerin Society and the Institute for Economic Affairs in London. In more recent years, the neoliberal agenda is carried forward by a new wave of educational institutions, such as the Institute for Humane Studies, the Cato Institute, and the Atlas Research Foundation. Popular fronts. Meanwhile, the enemies of civilization made further inroads. By the mid-1930s, Stalin had launched a new offensive, both in national politics and in the international theatre. 
Through a series of show trials, he effected the wholesale execution of his most important rivals, as well as their constituencies within the Communist Party. In Geneva, his foreign minister, Lidvinov, forged an anti-fascist alliance that for the first time brought the democratic Western states into coalition with the internationalist socialists in Moscow. The common ground of the alliance was, of course, opposition to the national socialists in Rome and Berlin. As things turned out, Lidvinov's move proved to be successful. In retrospect, it seems to have been by far the most effective strategy in the 20th century for undermining Western resistance to statism of the Russian variety. Western journalists and intellectuals played a shameful role covering up the reality of the Soviet regime. At first, Western diplomats in Geneva resisted the Russian advances, but this reluctance crumbled under the impact of the Spanish Civil War, 1936-1939. In Western Europe, all attention was thenceforth focused on nationalist socialism. The presence of fascist governments in Berlin, Rome and Madrid posed an immediate threat to the security of France and the United Kingdom, while the menace of internationalist socialism seemed remote. None of the diplomats in Geneva could yet imagine the Red Army standing on the Elbe and in Vienna. This lack of imagination was reinforced by the communist infiltration of the Roosevelt administration in the United States. Mrs. Roosevelt, in particular, entertained an entire coterie of communist intellectuals. Roosevelt had swept the states with a panoply of new laws and bureaus that made the country increasingly resemble old Europe. To mention just a few of these new laws and bureaus, the Tennessee Valley Authority, 1933, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, 1933, establishing a system of price control, the National Recovery Administration as part of the National Industrial Recovery Act, the Wagner Act, 1935, attempting to establish compulsory unionization, the Undistributed Profits Tax, 1936, confiscating up to 74% of profits, the Wages and Hours Act, 1938, establishing compulsory higher minimum wages and a compulsory 40-hour work week. The New Deal was new for America but old for Europeans. Mises recognized in the American events the very follies he and others had denounced ever since the war socialism of the First World War. He wrote, President Roosevelt's New Deal has been greeted with enthusiasm not only in its country of origin but also throughout the world. The reason for this general affinity is that the essential idea of the New Deal conformed exactly to public opinion. Everyone believed that it was necessary to replace capitalism and private enterprise with more government intervention. Although certain isolated measures were criticized, the new policy as a whole was received favorably. Most economists believed that American capitalism was now effectively doomed. Schumpeter, who in the year of Roosevelt's election had moved from Bonn to Harvard, was widely quoted as complaining that he could just as well have stayed in Germany. These premonitions turned out to be justified. One of the remaining differences between the new American policies and the new policies in Germany concerned communism. It quickly became obvious that the new American administration was pursuing a policy of rapprochement in its relations with Soviet Russia. One of Roosevelt's very first actions was to establish a bank to channel funds to the Bolsheviks. Though not a member of the League of Nations, the United States had nevertheless joined the anti-fascist alliance. In the spring of 1936, communist-initiated popular fronts won elections in France and Spain. Although the communists stayed in the background, ostensibly to fend off any concerns about secret ambitions for Bolshevik-style coup d'état, the fact remains that for the first time ever these countries had socialist governments. The French socialists now did what their Austrian and German comrades had done 18 years earlier. Leon Blum and his government nationalized the arms industries, outlawed right-wing political organizations, increased compulsory education, outlawed resistance against labor union violence, imposed a mandatory increase of wage rates, coercively increased minimum wage rates even further by reducing the labor time to 40 hours per week without reducing weekly salaries, imposed a minimum annual vacation of two weeks for every employee, along with subsidized train tickets courtesy of the taxpayer, and forced each firm with more than 10 employees to 
to pay for worker delegates to supervise the application of the new policies. Not surprisingly, a great number of small and medium-sized firms had to cease operations under this wave of regulations, and many of the workers who lost their jobs in this process could not find employment elsewhere because the surviving firms could not afford to hire them at the new minimum wage rates. Capitalists fled the country, and Leon Blum soon had to rely on public debt and inflation to keep his government functioning at all. In June 1937, he resigned. After little more than a year in power, in April 1938, the new Daladier government took over, reversing virtually all the new socialist laws and crushing labor union power in short but violent confrontations. In Spain, the correction was far less swift and far more violent. Mises traveled to Madrid in May 1936 to attend a conference for the promotion of international studies. In a press interview, he said that the conference was a step forward. In improving international relations, but Spain's relations with other nations made no further progress before the country imploded. Mises reported to Mahlup, "The anarcho-syndicalists are preparing the takeover, and the people on the right sharpen their long knives." In July 1936, the new Popular Front government had hardly taken office when civil war erupted. After more than two years of extremely bloody fighting, in the course of which more than one million Spaniards lost their lives, the authoritarian insurrectionists under General Franco marched victoriously into Madrid. The Spanish translation of the theory of money and credit had appeared just a couple of weeks before the outbreak of the war. Now it was condemned to oblivion. Until decades later, a group of determined economists resuscitated this work. Outside Spain, the case for laissez-faire fell on deaf ears too, while the opponents of the free society found a growing audience, especially if the rhetoric for more government control was flexible enough to accommodate a wide variety of political regimes. Thus, John Maynard Keynes made a splash in Germany, where the translation of his general theory appeared the very same year as the original. In the preface to the German edition, Keynes boasted that his theory was particularly well suited for totalitarian regimes. And lamented that it was less fit for the conditions prevailing in freer societies. Keynes writes, nevertheless, the theory of output as a whole, which is what the following book purports to provide, is much more easily adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state than is the theory of production and distribution of a given output produced under conditions of free competition and a large measure of laissez-faire. Similarly, in 1933, Keynes allowed a German translation of his paper on national self-sufficiency to be purged of passages that might have been offending to the new Hitler government. Mises did not comment on Keynes's general theory when it appeared in 1936. He reacted only when the Keynesian movement came into full swing and elevated the British economist to the status of a guru of the profession. In Mises's eyes, the Keynesian revolution was insignificant from the point of view of the history of ideas. Keynes had not brought forth a single new doctrine. At the onset of the Keynesian revolution, a few eminent historians of thought had pointed out that Keynes's views about the relationship between variations of the money supply, employment, and output had been anticipated and stressed in mercantilistic thought. The implication is that Keynes was not so much a revolutionary. But a reactionary champion of the ancien régime, the single most detailed study of his magnum opus confirmed this implication in rather devastating terms. Now, though I have analyzed Keynes's general theory in the following pages, theorem by theorem, chapter by chapter, and sometimes even sentence by sentence, to what some readers may appear a tedious length, I have been unable to find in it a single important doctrine that is both true. And original, even his major fallacies were old and had been refuted hundreds of times. The proper way to deal with Keynesianism, therefore, was to consider it from a sociological point of view. In 1948, Mises wrote, "For a correct appraisal of the success which Keynes's general theory found in academic circles, one must consider the conditions prevailing in university economics during the period between the two world wars." Among the men who occupied the chairs of economics in the last few decades, there have been only a few genuine economists. That is, men fully conversant with the theories developed by modern subjective economics. The ideas of the old classical economists, as well as those of the modern economists, were caricatured in the textbooks and in the classrooms. They were called such names as old-fashioned, orthodox, 
reactionary, bourgeois, or Wall Street economics. The teachers prided themselves on having refuted for all times the abstract doctrines of Manchesterism and laissez-faire. Two years later, he added, the great classical economists were harbingers of new ideas. The economic policies they recommended were at variance with the policies practiced by contemporary governments and political parties. As a rule, many years, even decades passed before public opinion accepted the new ideas as propagated by the economists and before the required corresponding changes in policies were effected. It was different with the new economics of Lord Keynes. The policies he advocated were precisely those which almost all governments, including the British, had already adopted many years before his general theory was published. Keynes was not an innovator and champion of new methods of managing economic affairs. His contribution consisted rather in providing an apparent justification for the policies which were popular with those in power in spite of the fact that all economists viewed them as disastrous. His achievement was a rationalization of the policies already practiced. Profound Transformations from August 1st to August 6th, 1937, Mises took part in the meetings of the Ninth International Congress of Philosophy, where he presented a paper on the logical character of the science of human conduct. Here he met the Polish philosopher Tadeusz Kotarbinski, who delivered a fascinating paper on the idea of the methodology of general praxeology. Though the paper itself did not have a lasting impact on Mises' thought, he was intrigued by the fact that Kotorbinsky had used the word praxeology to designate a general theory of human action. Mises had already come across it in a 1926 paper from another Polish scholar, the mathematical economist Eugen Slatsky. Mises quotes this paper in Epistemological Problems of Economics. This very passage contains the phrase, a universal praxeology, and thus suggests that Mises had adopted the word already in 1933. But in the original text, Mises used a slightly different expression, namely, eine allgemeine Praktik, meaning a general science of human practice or human action. He had occasionally used this term in the discussions of his Vienna private seminar, but because he abhorred terminological innovations, he had been reluctant to use it in print, even though he needed a good label for the cumbersome general theory of human action. Throughout the 1920s, he had used the word sociology, but by the early 1930s, he had to acknowledge that most other social scientists had come to understand something completely different by this term. Under the influence of fanatic anti-economists such as Ottmar Spann and Werner Zombard, sociology had become shorthand for an alternative social science, one that did not integrate the tenets of economics, but instead denied them and sought to replace economics with other explanations of the market economy, socialism, and the hampered market economy. But now there was a new term, praxeology. It was gaining ground in the academic literature, and, what is more, its champions seemed to use it in a way congruent with Mises' understanding of what a general science of human action was all about. Kotorbinsky probably talked to Mises about his general theory of fighting, in which he applied the general praxeological method to the phenomenon of war. And it was probably also Kotorbinsky who referred Mises to some of the pioneers of praxeology, such as the French philosopher Alfred Espina. Mises apparently did not have direct access to Espinas's work. Hayek looked up the reference for him in London, and it was also Hayek who discovered that the relevant passage from Espinas's book was taken verbatim from an article that Espina had published some years earlier. Mises found that the meaning of praxeology in Espinas's work was quite different from what he had in mind. Slutsky's use of the term was somewhat closer to his own views, but still did not quite hit the nail on the head. Mises thus initiated a second praxeological tradition. Present-day followers of the early French school call themselves praxeologists, and their discipline praxeology. These scholars, most of whom are academics from France and Poland, publish the series Praxeology, the International Annual of Practical Philosophy and Methodology.